and, and I'm not going to make your eyes glaze over, I promise. I just want you to see this bit. But I want you to understand this point. When you supinate, that subtalar joint is nice and tall. When you pronate, the subtalar joint kind of gets shorter. And that's because of what happens between the bones. So if you have one foot that might be excessively pronated or technically everted at the calcaneus, when the calcaneus everts, and I'll show you that in a moment, when that calcaneus everts, it shifts, guess what? That whole subtalar joint gets shorter. Now, what if you have a foot that is more pronated than the other? Guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna look like, and it's gonna feel like you've got one leg shorter than the other. Now, you have to admit that's eye-opening. I mean, that could be, you know, a real revelation for someone because you might even be wearing a heel lift. You might be wondering what's going on and somebody checked your pelvis and there's nothing going on in the pelvis. You don't have an upslip. You don't have a downslip. You don't have anything happening in the pelvis region that would lead to that one leg being shorter than the other. What if it's the foot and ankle causing that, right? So I, I really wanted to make sure you understood that today in case that impacts any of you in that fact. So here is how the bones connect and then we'll be done with the anatomy. I will show you Betty bones briefly and then we'll move on to the movement ed. But I want you to see, here's your heel bone, right? This is the forefoot. You can see all the bones here. And when we looked at that other picture, what that was was these bones were pulled away so that you could see the talus sitting on top of the calcaneus from the front, right? But they removed the forefoot, okay? But you can see here, doesn't this kind of look like a saddle, right? So the, this is the top of the heel bone, and this is how it connects with the talus, right? You can see the talus has this part and this part, right? How this kind of goes, dips in and goes up here. Here's the dip in, goes up here, and then the saddle in the back. So how these bones are shaped determines how the movement happens at the joint. The muscles creating the movement, the muscles controlling the movement. However, the movement itself is determined by the shape of the bones. And so, and, and I, I took some notes here so that I wouldn't forget some of the things I wanted to tell you. All right, and I think that was the last. As you can see here, obviously we've got lots of bones. But it's, and, and you do have a forefoot, you do have a, um, a mid-tarsal joint, you do have, have some others, and, and I, I may teach on that next week, depends on how um, creative and motivated I feel. And, and if I get some feedback and you say this is too complex and, and don't go that deep anymore, um, you know, I will listen to that. But I wanted you to see, uh, it's just amazing, right, how the, and this is the top of the talus, and you can see how that's designed so that that tibia, the shin bone, can really only go forward and back. It's gonna be limited because this is a concave surface, it dips down, it really can't go sideways because it's gonna be stopped. It's kind of controlled. It's kind of like having a big lip up on either side. You can only go so far, right? Which is also gonna limit rotation. So that's why that joint is mostly going forward and back in dorsiflexion, plantar flexion.